Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on intellectual property. Today, we're going to be doing a kind of 101 of IP, help you all understand what intellectual property is, how it applies, and in the context of what we do here at IP Australia, how we can support you to make decisions about your IP. Uh, today, I'm joined by Matt Lee. Welcome, Matt. Hi. Matt and myself, I'm Casey. We work in the startup and small business engagement team. And this is one of our activities that we uh, undertake quite regularly to help um, Australian businesses understand what IP they've got in their business and how they can make the most use of it. All right, today's session is definitely targeted at small businesses um, and those who are really new to IP. Um, this probably won't be as helpful for anyone who's um, applied for an IP right with us before or who's an attorney. But um, yeah, let's get underway. Okay. So IP Australia, we are the federal government agency based uh, predominantly in Canberra, but we have uh, quite a number of offices uh, around the country and a lot of staff working around the country. Um, our role is to, I suppose, administer the IP rights system in Australia. So what that means is we take applications for patents, trademarks, designs, and plant breeders rights. Um, we make an assessment on those applications to see uh, if those applications meet the test of the law that's applicable to them. And if they do, we grant an ownership of that particular IP right. Um, so when we talk about intellectual property, we talk about it in various forms. Um, we say intellectual property, intellectual property right. Um, we use patents, trademarks, designs and plant breeders rights. Um, so Matt, talking about what IP really is at the heart for someone first up to this, I suppose this is how we best describe what is IP and what is it what is it actually in someone's business. Okay, so a lot of people will, you know, obviously you've heard people talk, discuss intellectual property as a concept. The way that we like to define it is that the application of the mind to create something new and original. However, it can take many different forms and some that you wouldn't normally think about as well. So for example, a new invention, brand design, and artistic creation, but also other forms that you might encounter from day to day. Take, for example, the contact list on your phone. That's valuable intellectual property. Certainly, if a company were to get their hands on it, it would be of great value to them as well. Um, so you are surrounded all the time by various forms of intellectual property um, that you might not even think about um, too. So any of those endeavors where somebody's got that intellectual idea and realized it in the real world in some shape or form, um, that is intellectual property. So what we're seeing a lot of at the moment, particularly with a bit of a, a tech startup thing happening across the country, mm -hmm. everyone's doing some kind of software as a service type of activity. We're just seeing a lot of data based or ICT based technology. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, things that we probably as an office don't interact with as frequently, but data lists, as you said, phone call lists, customer data is, is really quite valuable to businesses these days. It's their kind of competitive edge in their marketing sense. Absolutely, and that also includes all of the know-how that you build up in your business as well, whether it's just the methods and processes that you use um, on a daily basis within your business or other types of innovation that you create too. Again, that could probably be classified as intellectual property. Okay. So just to kind of demonstrate some of the intellectual property types that we deal with here at IP Australia, as Casey mentioned before, we administer the registered intellectual property system. So for all of these different types of intellectual property, patents, trademarks, designs, and plant breeders rights, you have to apply to IP Australia before you actually grant that right and can start enforcing it. This on the slide is a Victor lawnmower, and it's actually got all of these types uh, uh, wrapped up into this one product. So to take you through them uh, one by one, first of all, we start with patents. So Victor developed um, a new and original recess cutting disc. Um, this at the time was something that nobody had seen before, and they were able to apply successfully for a patent on this particular piece of technology. We'll go into the details of the, um, each of the types of intellectual property a little bit later on as well as some of their requirements. But suffice to say, because they came up with this new invention that they were able to get protect, uh, protection over that particular aspect um, of the lawnmower. They also got protection over their brand via trademark. So the Victor lawnmower um, uh, is protected as a trademark for that name, as well as the way that it's written there um, as a logo too. So when we're talking about trademarks, we're talking about um, protection for brands and the way that you um, market yourself and differentiate yourself from other competitors um, out there in the same marketplace too. There's a registered design on the Victor lawnmower, in particular for the shape of that engine. So when we're looking at designs, we're looking at the aesthetic look of a particular piece of um, uh, 
properly, I guess. Uh, so this particular apparatus, for example, has a unique smooth shape. Most of the time when you think about lawn mowers, they'll have a blocky construction made with sharp angles. And so Victor actually invested um, the time and effort to create this particular unique looking lawn mower. And because it has that unique appearance, we're able to get a registered design for the appearance of that engine block. Finally, in here, we've also got the grass. Yes, it's not exactly um, part of the lawn mower itself, but it's the thing that it goes over. And um, that's what is protected by plant breeders rights. So in Australia, if you come up with a new variety of plant species, you can actually apply to like IP Australia to get protection for that new variety of plant species um, as well. So, so Walter Turf is the grass that's um, in the picture uh, here for you. Um, and again, because that was a unique uh, plant species, they were able to get protection for that as um, uh, something new. So when we talk about registered rights and making an application, we're talking about giving you an IP right, giving you an ownership over these things. So in the case of Victor here, um, there are three IP rights on this particular lawnmower. Um, and it each, each of those IP rights has different time lengths that it's owned by Victor. And basically what that means is it allows Victor to stop other people in uh, the landscaping market uh, copying what they're doing. Because if they do copy, Victor has a legal right to be able to stop them. And that's, I suppose, the essence of what registered IP or IP more broadly is all about. It's, it's about taking ownership of what you've created and allowing you to stop others from copying what you're doing um, and kind of edging in on your competitive advantage. And not only that, I guess the other thing that it demonstrates is that often when you come up with a new idea and you want to implement it in some way, such as a, creating a new lawnmower, is that it's not just one type of intellectual property that's going to apply to your product. There's going to be a whole suite of options that you may have available to you um, uh, that you can get protection for. So in this case, again, the new in technology underlying it was a patent, the branding was a trademark, the appearance was a design, and again, um, the grass, if they were in that particular type of business, would be a plant breeder's rights too. Now, this isn't the end of the story, Casey, though, is it? No. So there are also other types of IP um, that you probably have heard about and more familiar about. And these, I suppose, are my favourite because they're relatively free or low cost to manage. So the first one I want to talk about is copyright. <clears throat> so copyright um, on the slide that Matt's presented earlier up is talking about artistic creations, uh, literary works. And basically copyright is something that when you produce content, say um, you've written a story, you've published content on your website, you've taken a picture, um, the moment that that uh, content becomes public or is published, you have an inherent copyright from that time. So there are so many small businesses around this country that are um, doing a lot of digital media for their business. They're you know, using social media, they're using their website to really promote their brand. They have such value in their copyright assets in that sense. And it's very important to consider, okay, how are you creating your copyright? Do people know it's your copyright? And how are you treating it and managing it? Some of the examples that we use is uh, simple things to alert people to that you uh, that you own the copyright. Uh, something like a simple web statement on the bottom of your website might be a, a way to treat that. Um, I like to use the example um, Ash Newlin, who is the inventor of the scrubber wash pack. Um, Ash has a wonderful way that on his website he looks at uh, all of the things that he puts out in the marketplace through various platforms, and he says you can absolutely use my content, but you have to ask and you must be using it in a way that I deem appropriate, which is selling his product as an on-seller or a retailer. So different ways you can, I suppose, uh, think about copyright and use that as a, a way to manage your assets in your business. Now, I know that copyright applies a lot to artists and you know, people who work in that creative industry as well. Are they the people only who are going to be using copyright? No, so what we see too um, is obviously talking about our kind of our tech startups and our digital creators is uh, computer code. You know, if you're out there and you're developing code for a, a web-based product, a software product as it would be, um, that code, if you create it uh, so this from scratch and you're creating it on your own, uh, you are the copyright owner of that code. Um, so it's not just visual elements that everyone can see at the surface level. It does obviously go below the surface with that computer code. Yep, and I think they're treated just the same as authors. The computer code is actually treated as a literary work. So if you're somebody writing a book or you're somebody writing computer code, it's re you can choose the language that more suits you and um, that will also be protected by copyright. So the other um, uh, unregistered IP right that I want to talk about is trade secrets. And this is, I suppose, a low cost management strategy that small businesses should consider. When we talk about trade secrets, um, I've got an example of Coca-Cola on the screen. 
Everyone knows Coke, everyone has obviously probably had a, a drink of Coca-Cola in their lifetime, but many people don't know that it's actually a really good case study in how a company manages and treats their intellectual property. What many people don't know is that the recipe for Coke could have been patented many years ago, which would have given them a 20 year ownership over the recipe and the method for producing um, that recipe. But in doing so, they would have had to expose that recipe to the world. Coke obviously looked at their business model and where they wanted to be in the market at the time and thought, no, this is some pretty significant intellectual property. This is the, the essence of what we're doing. Um, and we don't want that IP out in the marketplace. So they have, I suppose, the use of a trade secret strategy and they employ very strict confidentiality processes um, and contracts within their organization to protect that recipe so it doesn't get out. Unfortunately, I think it was around 2006 um, timeframe, uh, there was a breach in that practice within the Coke enterprise where two employees tried to leave the recipe and sell it to Pepsi. Oh, man. Um, and I suppose to Pepsi's credit, they obviously understand the value of intellectual property. They actually alerted the Coke officials um, and the matter was settled, obviously, uh, for an undisclosed sum. So one can only assume that was quite a, a significant breach of the contracts that were in place to protect that secret. So as a business, it's also very important to think about this as a strategy. You may have something that you think, oh, okay, I might patent that, or I might, um, you know, I might look at how I can, you know, use that as my competitive advantage. You need to think about what benefits are against the different ways that you can manage your IP. And in some instances, things like you know, the data list that we spoke about before, using trade secret strategies within your business to keep that information within your business. Um, might actually be a really great option for you, particularly in your early stages when you're starting out and you're trying to obviously understand your commercial viability. Okay, we just had a few questions come in. So the first one was the name of the person um, who had the website copyright. So the name of the person was Ash Newland. Uh, so his product is called the Scrubber Bag, um, which he developed um, as a bit of a side hustle to his regular job as an attorney. Um, so that's you can go and have a look up um, the details of that product online. Um, we also got another question, which was that if you work in the business as a coder and create copyright material that's published, who owns the copyright? the coder or the company? That's a great question. It's something that we've recently done a bit of work on, Matt, in your patch. Yeah, so my background is um, I've worked in uh, the computing field of, as a patent examiner for um, about seven years or so um, here at IP Australia before moving in to work with KC and the startup um, engagement team in communications. But to look at that, is it, it's a bit of a complicated question um, simply because of it depends a lot on the relationship that you have uh, with um, the company in the first place, um, as well as the circumstances of how you created that code. Generally speaking, uh, to be brief on this point, is that if you happen to be working in um, an employment relationship and your code was developed as part of that employment relationship, then the IP will be uh, will sit with the company and they will be the owners of the copyrights in that code. However, by default in Australia, um, if you don't have a written agreement which says otherwise, if you are a contractor, an independent contractor, and you do work on behalf of a contracting company, that if you haven't got an agreement which explicitly sets out ownership of the copyright, then you as the contractor will actually own the copyright in that software code uh, by default as well. So again, there's a lot of different factors which may kind of um, play into this, but that is um, the simplest uh, explanation, I guess, for those situations as well. Good questions though. Yeah, great question. All right, let's um, let's continue and move along to our next slide. So why register and why not register, man? I mean, this is the question we always get more out and about. <laughs> Absolutely. So look, the most obvious reason that you would want to get your intellectual property registered is from a protection standpoint. You have invested all the time, effort and resources to develop a new idea, take it to market, you know, and um, uh, try and get some traction with it. And the last thing that you want is for somebody to come along and take that away from you or for you to lose control over the thing that you've developed as well. But there's plenty of other reasons why you might want to think about getting some protection um, onto your intellectual property, again, via uh, the registered rights or maybe even the unregistered rights too. For example, if you have um, some level of protection of your intellectual property, sometimes that can actually create more opportunities for you later down the track. If you want to collaborate with somebody else to work together on the the project, um, bring somebody into your business or company, then you can more freely share your ideas by having that protection in place so that you don't need to worry about the worst situations where they decide to take your idea and run off with it themselves. 
On top of that, there are also other opportunities to create new revenue streams through things like licensing. So if you have a piece of technology that another company might want to um, have a part of, um, but they don't want to necessarily have um, ownership or control over it, you can keep control as the owner of that intellectual property, license it out to them and just receive royalties instead. So all of a sudden you've turned a potential competitor into a partner and you are opened up, you've both also opened up that revenue stream in addition to. But however, just don't think about, uh, again, the registered intellectual property rights. There's also the other options of uh, whether you want to release it into the public domain um, or open source and have other people use your intellectual property. I know that recently the Tesla company, Elon Musk, who's been in the news um, you know, fairly frequently, um, has decided to release um, all of the patents that they happen to have on their Tesla um, electric car uh, technology as well. And so there are sometimes intellectual property strategies which involve um, doing other things rather than keeping your IP locked down and ultimately they'll be up to you and the kind of objectives kind of objectives that you want to achieve. Okay. <clears throat> so the next thing we're going to I suppose move on to is patents and I do want to just obviously let everyone know that's um, participating online today we will do our best to obviously give you as much information as we can on each of the IP rights we can't really go into the depth of them so Patents, Matt, this is your forte. This is uh, this is why you sit next to me in these <laughs> sessions. All right. What so, is a patent? So a patent, as we mentioned before with the Victor Lawnmower example, deals with inventions. And when we talk about inventions, it's actually a pretty broad definition. Most people think of inventions as somebody tinkering around in the backyard, in the shed somewhere, you know, with smoke billowing out everywhere. And that's true. You can have physical products, so apparatuses or other types of things, um, which are regarded as inventions. However, inventions also cover methods and processes in Australia, as well as um, substances. So for people working in the chemical engineering field, for example, or pharmaceutical fields, if you come up with a substance, um, uh, that in some circumstances can be regarded as a new invention. So for those particular uh, products um, and inventions, uh, what a patent does, it will give protection over the functions and features of that product processes and again as I mentioned methods and processes uh, which can be the underlying basis of um, business services as well. The patent itself will give you a monopoly right so you as the owner have control over that patent in terms of who sells it, manufactures it and otherwise exploits it and the term of that protection will last for 20 years for what we call a standard patent or eight years for an innovation patent. Now, the difference between a standard patent and an innovation patent is that, generally speaking, an innovation patent is easier to obtain uh, as with a lower bar of entry compared to a standard patent. And in return, we give you a shorter term of eight years protection. If you want further protection, then maybe the standard patent is the way to go instead. It's important to note, too, that at this time, a lot of our um, small businesses are really kind of discovering intellectual property for the first time. Ask me the question. So. 20 years around the world and I suppose no when we talk about patents in the context of what we're talking about today we're talking about having a monopoly in Australia so IP Australia is only able to grant a patent um, within Australia if you would like to seek a patent um, in other jurisdictions such as maybe perhaps you'd like to export to the United States you would obviously need to seek that same protection um, in the United States and there are mechanisms that this um, office provides and some information on our website on how that might go about but a really great patent attorney will be, I suppose, your best guide for that risk, that activity. Yeah, that's a great point. And I guess that also leads into this particular question as to, you know, is patenting the right way to go? And if you decide to go down this path, you know, what are the costs going to be? One of the things that we want to encourage here at IP Australia isn't to say to everybody that, yes, you need to go out and get a patent, you know, because that's the way to go. Because in a lot of circumstances, that's not going to be the correct strategy. One thing that you need to consider again is what are the holistic costs that entering the patent system is going to be. So filing, uh, the fees for filing for a patent application are on our website, but you also need to consider whether you might need to seek legal advice or representation uh, from a, um, a specific patent attorney, for example. Um, if you get a patent attorney involved, then that's also going to increase the costs that you're going to face in either the drafting of the application, maybe even filing and prosecuting it further down the track too. Once you have your patent, also think about what you're going to do with it. Are you simply going to let it sit there, maybe use it for those licensing or collaboration opportunities I mentioned before? But if you actually have to enforce it, what's that going to cost you too? Taking it through the cost system, court system is a costly exercise and something that you might need to be prepared uh, for. Similarly, if you also seek patents overseas, that's also going to cost you money um, as well. And the more countries that you apply for, 
is going, just going to multiply that cost out too. One strategy that we've um, heard from uh, uh, certain applicants, for example, is to just pick your markets then pick the markets which are most important to you and focus your efforts in there um, so that you're not necessarily applying for protection unnecessarily in lots of smaller markets, which aren't going to bother you too much um, uh, as well. So there's lots of factors at play, but again, we encourage you to you know go and have a good think about what you want to do, how you want to use your patent. Also think about um, the types of uh, strategy that you want to employ for your business holistically, and as well as seeking advice um, from professionals to give you the help that you need going forward. So one of the products um, that our team developed uh, just over 12 months ago now is the Engaging and Attorney Toolkit. So if you are inventing something, you feel that so there's something in what you're doing that could be patentable, um, I would strongly encourage you to be able to jump onto our website in our patent section and look for the Engaging an Attorney Toolkit. Um, this will be a really great resource to help ask you those questions of what you need to do and how you can prepare before you meet with a patent attorney so that when you walk into that office and you're having a meeting, it's constructive, it's valuable, um, and you're prepared and can, I suppose, ask the right questions and really get value out of their time. And they can also, too, understand if you're a client they're able to support more easily yeah and that one other aspect of that particular toolkit was that that was developed in consultation with the patent attorney profession too so this is information that you know we have both agreed on as IP Australia and the patent attorney profession uh, to say that this is useful to you as potential applicants so you know it's not something that we were trying to go and say you know uh, take away um, uh, business from from that profession because they do have an a really important role to play in providing you the help that you need. But in certain circumstances, there are quite a lot of steps that you can take to prepare yourself uh, for those interactions as well. So definitely encourage you to check that out. We do have a question which has come in, which is saying that if you have a patent and there's another company which has um, copied the business idea, do they just become considered as a competitor in the market? So if there is no patent in place, yes, I think is the probably the, the basic answer. Um, no one, I suppose, has ownership over that intellectual property. It, it, we don't, I suppose, unable to ascertain if it could be protected by a patent or not. Um, but if it isn't protected, then uh, I suppose it's it's open for anyone to look at and use and implement in the way that may drive a commercial benefit in that business. That's right. And one of the rules of the patent system is that once something is out there and is publicly available, um, then someone can't subsequently come along at a later date and then apply for a patent themselves and lock it down. We only give patents to inventions which are new and inventive. Um, that's for a standard patent. And so what we do is that we do have a look out there in the marketplace, um, look around the world to say, has somebody had this idea before and publicly disclosed information about it? Because you're already out there in the marketplace, this other competitor who comes along then can't claim themselves that they were the inventor of this particular idea um, and then uh, get a patent for it themselves because you have that publicly information available. The other thing to think about though, on the flip side, is that it's another really important consideration that before you enter into business and go and launch your product is to do a search yourself and to see whether you have you, there is a patent on the same technology out there that you really want to avoid because if it's in force and affects your particular technology, then the last thing that you want to do is to find out that you're the subject yourself of an infringement lawsuit later on. Again, there's some tips in that engaging a patent attorney toolkit, um, which will tell you how you can do some basic searches yourself. Um, and again, that could help you uh, to save some headaches down the track. All right. So talking about uh technologies or things that were not patented. <laughs> this is our favourite case study. Well, favourite for, for <laughs> unfortunately, a bit of a sad reason. So this is a power board, which I think most people should have, you know, multiple uh, devices of this type at, in their homes. Um, something which was uh, developed uh, quite a while ago, I think it was in the 70s, um, by a gentleman called Frank Bannigan. So he and his um, business partners um, were trying to solve the problem, which is a fairly simple problem, if you think about it now, of connecting multiple devices to a single power source. And they went to a workshop and developed this particular product, uh, which is the power board that we see today. However, because they thought it was such a simple uh, device, they made the decision not to get any patent protection for it. And everybody knows the rest of the story is because that there wasn't any level of protection on it, that there were many other copies which were brought to market by rival companies to basically sell their own versions of the power board themselves. 
if he if Frank, if Frank and his team had gone and sought the patent for it, then maybe it would be a different world that we live in today. But the quote that you can see on screen is is from him about the lost opportunity that he had because he didn't have that protection on there. And again, it's not necessarily about um, getting you know all the money flowing to you uh, for a particular invention, but it's just about having that control over the future of the product um, uh, by being able to obtain the patent um, as well. So he would have had some semblance of control as to that, where that technology was going. And in this particular case, he does have regrets, which is a bit unfortunate about that lost opportunity um, for developing what is now a ubiquitous invention um, as well. Yeah. So my kind of the moral to the story is, is please please think about what it is you have and, and what could be the commercial viability. Even if it's a simple idea. Yeah, this is a very simple idea, isn't it? And um, please don't do a Frank. <laughs> <laughs> sure. While we're um, while you're just thinking about that and getting that information through to us, well, there's another just question, which final question, which is coming through on patents. And again, keep your questions coming; they're great. Um, I think it says uh, systems saying that it's like how long will it take um, to obtain a patent uh, for standards and innovation patents? So it'll take some time um, and it varies depending on the technology because we have you know, different numbers of applications coming in uh, for different types of technology and we assign them to specialists who work in that field of technology um, as well to assess. But generally speaking, it can take anywhere between um, a year, two years or three years in the extreme cases um, as well. Uh, I believe there's somewhere on the website which has uh, the work fronts available uh, to see, but as a general statement, probably on average would say probably two years. Um, and again, that could be faster or slower depending on the particular workload that we have um, at the moment. And that applies both to innovation patents and standard patents. Innovation patents have a slightly different system because you don't actually have to get them through the examination process um, uh, to actually get the innovation patent in the first place. It's only by the time that you want to enforce it, such as taking somebody to court or using it to resolve a dispute, that that's when you need to get it examined as well. Again, more details about the operation and the differences between both standard and innovation patents on our website. So trademarks, um, for those of you who are activating a business, who have a trading identity, I suppose a brand in the marketplace, trademarks is for you. Trademarks is, it, it covers every business. Um, trademark at its fundamental is a sign used to distinguish the goods and services of one trader from those of another. So basically all that is saying to us is, um, I am company A, match your company B. Company A is a sign that distinguishes my company and company B is a sign that distinguishes Matt's company. Um, and you know, our consumers in the market will know what goods and services they get from me and they'll know what goods and services they get from Matt. Um, as we see each day, we know that Coles and Woolworths are two companies that meet this, um, this particular criteria. Woolworths, you know what you expect when you walk into that store, uh, versus Coles, when you walk into the Coles supermarket. And, and the same with Aldi. They each have, uh, I suppose, the same goods and services, but you know what it is. What is their brand is, I suppose, so well known in the marketplace for their consumer base. In Australia, if you come to IP Australia and you select a trademark application, you'd obviously like to protect your brand. Um, if it is, I suppose, accepted and it, it meets our examination processes, we will give you a 10 year registration on that trademark. So you'll own that brand and you'll be able to control that brand for 10 years. And the great thing about trademarks, unlike patents, is that you can renew that brand indefinitely. Um, so patents is a 20 year life cycle. Uh, trademarks can go on as long as the company and the brand is active um, and as long as the company wants to control that brand. Now, I see that there's a point there that you have about the, the R symbol uh, yes. um, as well. What's that all about? So what we see a lot um, in the marketplace and a lot of people don't know is when you see that little R with the circle, it means that the brand is actually registered. It has come to IP Australia and has um, met the test of the Trademark Act and it has been given a registration. So if I haven't got a trademark, can I still use the R symbol? No. I mean, I've got a trademark, which I reckon is pretty snazzy. Please do not. Um, it is an offence to use the R if you do not have a registered trademark, if it hasn't made its way through the application process. However, as you can see uh, up here, we have a little TM in the circle. Um, the way that you can obviously tell people that you wish to claim trademark protection under common law um, is to use a little TM in a circle. And basically what that's stating to the market is, I've established this brand, I've established this identity, and I'm claiming it as my trademark. It hasn't either yet gone through the registration system or maybe it doesn't quite meet the full test of the registration system. So you can use a common law provision. Um, and over time, um, ongoing use will build that value and that reputation 
um, and you, you, it will become quite a valuable trademark however, not registered. So I can more freely use the TM symbol yeah. wherever I want to? Absolutely. All right, great. My snazzy trademark, I'm going to let You're going go to TM it. TM it. Yep, excellent. All righty. So when we talk about trademarks, we talk about brands, um, they are literally in our face every single day. Um, and you probably don't realise. I mean, you look at the two products that we've got on screen here. We've got Vegemite and we've got Arnott's Chocolate Ripple Biscuits. Um, both of these brands have multiple trademarks. So we know that Vegemite is now owned by Bega. So there's two trademarks in, in the Vegemite brand. Um, Arnott's is a trademark. Uh, Chocolate Ripple is a trademark. Um, and so there are many different ways that brands apply and sub-brands apply. And all of these can be protected by a trademark. Basically, again, what we were saying before is it allows us to stop others from copying. So as we know in Australia, there's only one Arnott's company. Um, and you will only see the, you know, the Chalk Ripple made by the Arnott's brand. Um, and, you know, there's many versions of, I suppose, a... Vegemite-esque substance, but there is only one Vegemite, and particularly if you're an Aussie, I think that's a that's a given. Now you mentioned that there's like there's only one Arnott's. Um, now if I if let's say that my surname was Arnott as well, and I wanted to go into business, but I didn't really want to do anything to do with chalk ripple biscuits. Maybe I want to go into a completely different industry instead, like fashion, for example. Is that going to be all right? It will be fine. So what Arnott's have a trademark over is um, their brand is protected in the food industry, um, the confectionery industry. So they make a series of food products, and they protect their brand in that marketplace. They don't have any interest in fashion, um, and it could. And if you're a consumer and you're looking at an Arnott's biscuit and an Arnott's dress, you wouldn't be confused that the source of those goods is the same person. You'd be like, oh no, that's the Arnott's fashion company, and this is the Arnott's biscuits company. Oh great! So we will talk about how we classify trademarks um, not too far from now. Although I'm not sure if Arnott's have ever thought about the fashion industry because I know that my kid at the moment is like when she's eating her breakfast, definitely likes to wear her veggie mite all over herself anyway. So <laughs> maybe something for the, them to consider. <laughs> so a business name in Australia is required. You have to register a business name if you want to conduct business, and that's a regulatory requirement. Um, what a business name doesn't give you is any ownership over the use of that name in the marketplace. And if you were to look on the business name registration uh, database that's made available from the ABR website, you will see that you might find very similar business names to your business name. Uh, so for example, if I was Casey's Cakes, I know there is Cakes by Casey. I know there is Casey and Jane's Cakes. And there's similarities, but none of us have ownership to be able to, I suppose, stop others from using that name if it's just registered. If I wanted to have ownership over that name and I wanted to stop others using that name in the marketplace, I would need to seek a trademark protection because that gives me a legal right to do so. So on the screen, what I've got for you is just kind of a bit of a summary of the differences. So as we can see in the Nestle example, Nestle have a company and a business name as Nestle and Nestle Group. They also have a domain name as nestle.com.au. They have a trademark, Nestle, but they also have various other trademarks that are, I suppose, in their, their trading identity, their product identity out in the marketplace. So trademarks extends beyond a business name and can be a variety of different identities and brands within the company, but it, it can also be the company name as well. So if you are, I suppose, in thinking about your business name and you're thinking about your trademark identity, your, your brand exposure in the market, um, some businesses do not have any of these aligned. Um, you could be ABC Proprietary Limited. Um, your business name might be Jumping Jacks and your trademark um, might be Jumping Jacks uh, Happy Holidays. I'm, I'm making stuff up as I'm going along here. But there are different ways in which you can structure your business identity in order to be able to position yourself and your trademark strategy. So I think um, we have got a question around our trade names. Can you read yeah, that? Yeah, so, so the question or well, the comments just coming through is like, we thought trade names are not legal uh, because registered trademarks. So I guess, um, again, you know, like is, is there, you know, what what is that difference of, of those um, of those trademarks registered trademarks compared to that, that trade name as well? Um, so I suppose it comes down to a legal ownership and a right to stop others. A trademark is the only way that you will be able to stop others using your identity in the marketplace. Um, a business name, I think there used to 
be called trading names, um, was a regulatory requirement that the government asked, and that was probably more to align um, the corporate ownership of that entity um, for, I suppose, any taxation purposes and the like. So it's certainly nothing to do in the IP space, but there, I, we, we want to demonstrate there's a very clear difference between the two. And it's something many early stage businesses don't understand and we don't want them to get in a pickle um, like that lady on the Shark Tank episode. And again, as Casey would mention in her example about um, Casey's case, is that the trademark, the protection given to you by a trademark also extends to those similar uh, trademarks as well as anything that people might get confused about. So it's not necessarily only going to protect you for those things which are an exact copy of your trading name. If you have your trademark um, for your trading name, it'll also cover any variants of it that people again might find similar by the time that they're shopping around and looking for you out there in the marketplace. Let me tell you a story. <clears throat> Tale of two fat ducks. <laughs> um, so this is a kind of a classic, you know, I suppose, David and Goliath story, but it's also a really good example around um, the similarities uh, uh, description that Matt was showing you there. So everyone knows Heston, he's the, the gentleman on the left, um, but many people don't know is that Heston actually wasn't the first person in Australia to own the tra trademark Fat Duck. Um, that was this lady over here on our right. Um, she created a cafe in, I think it's in North Melbourne with her business partner, um, and named it the Fat Duck Cafe. They registered their business name, they searched on the Australian trademark register to see if the Fat Duck was, I suppose, taken and owned by any other company, and it wasn't. Um, so they activated their business. You know, they did their due diligence. They thought, you know, we're going to be a small time cafe in the north of Melbourne. This is okay for us. This is, we're happy. We're comfortable. We're going to take our step forward and open. So, yeah, so they've done. They've done a good job. Um, unfortunately, in this circumstance, uh, probably around a six month period is overlapping these two instances. Uh, Heston, off the back of his MasterChef fame, brought the fat duck from the UK to the Australian market and opened it at the Crown Casino in Melbourne. Now, because obviously Heston has quite um, substantial financial resources behind him, he obviously sought um, the IP lawyers to go out and make sure that he can obviously operate in the Australian market and to get all of his registrations and business compliance underway. In that process, uh, Heston has, or Heston's company, has uh, sought to secure the trademark for the fat duck, um, and they had success and that mark was re registered to uh, Heston's company. What they, I suppose, then did is they sent a series of cease and desist letters around to people who they felt were infringing on, Re on Heston's registered IP. Um, so this lady here on the right, she and her business partner received a letter saying, please stop, you're using my registered trademark um, and I need you to obviously not do that. They also sent letters to the Fat Duck, I think it's a pub in Sydney, and the Fat Duck PHAT, so a phonetic equivalent, um, and they also had to change their brand. What we can tell from this kind of case study is that we take a number of lessons. I do want to kind of really hash home that Heston actually isn't a bad guy. It sounds like he is. However, he's just doing what every Australian IP owner has the right to do, and that is to stop others from copying or using their registered trademark. And again, I think there's one, one point to note as well is that his team actually did a search of the trademark register to see beforehand, was there any business out there on the trademark register which had a registered trademark for the fat duck? And maybe it's the case that you can hypothesize that if they had registered their uh, fat duck uh, trademark and had it on the register, by the time that Heston did a search and said, oh, there is something on the register, he might have instead gone and said, all right, somebody's got the trademark for you know, the restaurant business in Australia. I still really want to come to Australia. How about, how about I pay you to take ownership or maybe just have a license for the Fat Duck trademark? It gives you the, a seat at the table to negotiate when you own the IP. Yeah. What we can detect, I suppose, is a bit of a cost-benefit analysis on this is that uh, this lady obviously had to change the branding. Um, she lost goodwill. There was uniform changeover, not to mention the legal fees to seek advice about how she might navigate this situation. You know, we put a bit of a, a ballpark figure of at least $10,000, possibly a lot more. You know, we don't run commercial businesses. We, we wouldn't know the full cost that would be associated with that. Um, and had she and her partner come through the system, it would have cost them about $500 at the most um, to secure the IP right for the Fat Duck trademark. Um, so, you know, sometimes it could probably act as an insurance policy and as Matt said, you know, maybe give you a, and give you a seat at the table um, 
from uh, that in that particular discussion. Now, one thing also to kind of mention before we move on as well is that the ladies who ran the Fat Duck Cafe have some kind of rights um, under common law uh, for uh, what, what is otherwise known as a common law trademark. So there is some recourse that they could have had to actually take on Heston and um, defend their territory. But common law trademarks have quite a few tricky hurdles to jump over to establish the fact that you have a trademark or not, such as saying, have you got a built up reputation and the like as well. It's much simpler to simply go and get your trademark registered again for a pretty small fee in the, in the big picture of things. And in that particular instance, you know, it could have changed the whole situation um as well so in the end um, they didn't go down that path after getting some advice um, about it and decided that the best thing that they could do is rather than um, have that dispute with heston is to just change the name of their brand uh, which again has those costs involved okay oh sorry now i do know that there are quite a few questions uh, coming in it's like we will have seen those as well as the questions before about patents as well so i do promise that we will get to uh, those questions and um uh, at the end of the session as well so what I want to do is I want to just exit our slide deck just for a moment, Matt, and I want to bring up um, our website. And I'm just making sure that everyone can see that. So I want to jump onto ipaustralia.gov.au. Um, many of you probably have already visited this site because you've come onto our site to get into this webinar. So if you're a business and you're thinking about, okay, I've got a brand, I think it's a pretty snazzy brand, I don't want others to be using it or I want to check if others are using it. Um, I just wanted to give you a few quick tips before we progress on how you might do that. Unfortunately, we do not have time to go into the depth of it today because we've got a bit more coverage. But I do want you to go into our search section here. Um, and what you will see on our website is that we will have, um, obviously our upskill program will give you a little bit more of a step-by-step -step process. We also have the Australian Trademark Search um, system. So what you'll be able to do is type in some search terms into that system and check what else is on the register. Matt and I have been talking quite a lot today about uh, what in marketplace, so what um, are these people doing and what are they requiring? So you will just need to make sure that if you do find something that's the same or very similar to your trademark, have a look about what they are covered for. And that will be in what we call the classes or classification section. So you've got to see if it's food, if it's mechanics, if it's software, and make a bit of a decision about that. We do have an upcoming webinar um, on trademarks and we also have some content available on our previous webinar stage if you would like to take uh, a little bit more time to get familiar with trademarks um, in the next day or two. But I definitely recommend that you jump into Upskill. Um, it's a step-by-step -step process. It's five short modules um, and most people that are going through this program are getting through the program within three to four days um, and are coming out the other end, uh, I suppose, a little bit more confident about how to apply for a trademark. All right, we will jump back to our slide deck. No worries. Designs. And again, we'll try and, I'm just mindful of the time, but it's like, we'll keep your questions coming. We'll definitely, if you stick around, uh, get to answering those questions um, uh, shortly. We've only got four slides to get to. Okay, <laughs> so the design system, uh, going turning back to the Nick Lawn though, as I mentioned before, looks at the visual um, aesthetic of a particular physical product. So in that case, they had a, you know, a smooth curved engine block for the lawnmower. And when we're talking about designs, we're talking about that particular um, type of thing. You know, we're not really talking about blueprints and schematics, which some people kind of think about when they hear the word design instead. Instead, it's really the kind of shape or pattern ornamentation of that product instead. Now, as you can imagine, this is going to be very useful to certain industries, such as the fashion industry, but also to other types of industrial products that you might not consider, such as um, simple things like toothbrushes and the shape of a toothbrush, or even the pattern that you might find on a tire tread as well. So anything with that unique aesthetic look um, is going to uh, is possibly going to be uh, eligible for design protection. Again, something to think about too is that if it's got some kind of functional aspect that might fall into the patent category instead, which is looking at inventions, but if it's really just there so that it looks a certain way, then designs might be the way to go. Registration lasts for five years and then you can also renew it up to a maximum 10 year period too. Now, one thing that's really important about the design system, which is a bit unique to the design system in Australia, is that you have to be careful about what information that you publish um, and release publicly um, of, about your design. Because we have a very strict rule that if you happen to exhibit your design or publish it somewhere that people can see it, um, then they'll actually 
prevent you from getting registration for that design later down the track. And this, if you happen to work in those industries, um, or maybe you're a student who's, you know, wants to exhibit your design somewhere, think about when you want to put in an application for your design before you go and release it publicly, because unfortunately there's also no exceptions to this as well. You can't come to us later and say, oh, I didn't know about it, or, you know, I really wanted to just put in my application the next day. If that um, if design has been published, unfortunately, we draw a line in the sand and say, sorry, you can't apply for um, design protection on that thing that you publicly um, demonstrated um, after that particular date. Again, we do have a very in-depth webinar on designs, and if you are a designer and you're working in a product development space, we strongly encourage you to um, join us on that. We do have our qualified design examiners um, who come and host that session, um, and you can ask a lot of in-depth questions about designs and get really familiar with the process so that you're informed and aware about how you might approach that. Okay, so one example that we have of this registered design is the Keep Cup, which again is an Australian inven invention uh, with uh, such a big movement towards uh, away from disposable plastics and disposable materials. You know, Keep Cups were a great product which came into the market to say to coffee drinkers and other people who drink beverages, here's a product that you can reuse multiple times. But not only does it have functional aspects, and yes, the Keep Cup company did actually go and apply for patents um, uh, for the innovations that they came up with in regards to this product, but also spent some time to give it that unique look and feel. And because they um, came up with that unique design about the way that the Keep look Keep Cup looks, uh, they were also able to secure design protection for that as well. And again, you can see the quote from Abigail uh, from Keep Cup um, about that uh, aspect. Yeah, their, their whole brand premise with Keep Cup is about the functionality and the aesthetic. Um, and I suppose they can obviously protect their brand not only with a trademark, but that visual appearance, like when you see the Keep Cup, it is, it's a Keep Cup, everyone knows that. Um, and there's, you just, the essence of what they're trying to do and how they're positioning their product as a whole, um, they've wrapped a really great boundary around that product with design rights, trademarks and patents to make sure that that unique aspect, their competitive advantage, what makes them popular, is kept within their company. Yep, and absolutely. I think Francis has said this, like, does it apply to packaging? Absolutely, it, it can also, that's part of your product and it can um, apply to um, that function, sorry, to that aspect um, of your product as well. The last slide we want to cover off, and we are only going to spend just a short minute on it, is plant breeders' rights. And the reason that we don't go too far into plant breeders' rights is that um, it's a very specific um, IP right, um, and people who are in the horticultural industry, uh, generally speaking, have uh, access to qualified professionals to support applications. Um, but just briefly, kind of like a, an invention, if you come up with a new plant variety, you're able to come to IP Australia and seek an ownership over that for 25 years. Um, it provides an exclusive right for you to kind of grow, sell and export that. So you have control over that plant variety and you can make money uh, through royalties or direct sales. Um, and it covers a variety of GM plants, trees, flowers, uh, fruit, grape varieties as well. So it's quite used, I suppose, in the wine industry as well. All right, everybody, have a wonderful day. Um, we will leave you with obviously our phone number, our website, and if you're on social media, please be sure to connect and follow us um, so that you've got the latest information from our office to help you um, make the best decisions with your IP.